This is also a nice ingredient to have around in the summer because it looks so pretty. It's just lovely, the colour of red onion. That goes into nice thin slices. And then you separate the slices into rings. And so now we're getting even more pretty colour contrast. And then a few slices of lemon, about half a lemon. which just gives that sort of zesty, lemony flavour. Again, thin slices, nice sharp knife. In we go. And now it's going to have another ingredient, which is capers. Wonderful, lovely capers. I think capers were invented specially to go with fish. They really do taste lovely. And you need to have... Um, a tablespoonful of capers. These were a special present to me from somebody who's been to Greece for their holiday, Corfu in fact, so these are Greek capers, they're very special ones. So they go in next. Give a nice little bit of piquancy. Now we're going to make a marinade to pour over that and in my jug here I've got measured out a quarter of a pint of light olive oil. And that's going to have two fluid ounces of cider vinegar to join it. I think cider vinegar is just the right one for this. Half a teaspoon of salt. A teaspoon of English mustard powder, which I always think gives a nice kick to sauces. A teaspoonful of sugar. Just helps to take off the sharpness and then the juice of two limes. Now it's going to have the hot and we're going to use a dessert spoon of Tabasco sauce, give it a little shake first and if you think wow that sounds really fiery, it isn't, I promise you. It's got that nice kick in it this marinade but it really isn't too hot. Dessert spoon of that and then good old English ingredient next, Worcester sauce. Dessert spoon of Worcester sauce. And just a little bit of freshly ground pepper. Give it all a good whisk. And then you pour this over the rest of the ingredients, the marinade, and the good news about this recipe is they're now going to sit the prawns in the marinade for 48 hours. So that's marvellous because if you're inviting somebody for a summer meal, it means you can get the whole thing done two days before your guests arrive. Cover it with cling film, put it in the fridge, and then take it out for about an hour before you want to serve it. And then when you're ready to serve it, you can garnish it with a few sprigs of coriander. Fresh coriander has a lovely flavour with this and just a few slices of lime which give also a nice appearance and a colour to the dish. And I like to serve this with some homemade bread. This is a nice chunky whole wheat bread and it's made with poppy seeds and sunflower seeds and the recipe for that is in the book. Serve it with bread and butter and there you are, a lovely summery lunch dish, hot and sour pickle prawns. And now I want to show you chilled marinated trout with fennel. This is served with a white wine and tomato flavoured sauce. And you begin by taking three quarters of a teaspoon of black peppercorns, the same amount of coriander seeds and half a teaspoon of fennel seeds. Then work them into a powder using a pestle and mortar. Dry roast the powder for about a minute to draw out the flavour, then add a little oil to the pan. Extra virgin olive oil is best as it has a more fruity flavour. When it's really hot, cook a finely chopped onion and a clove of garlic for about five minutes. Next, add a pound of chopped skin tomatoes, a tablespoon of lemon juice and another one of white wine vinegar, then eight fluid ounces of dry white wine. When it begins to bubble, season and then add half a teaspoon of oregano. Now trim and slice one head of fennel and add this to the pan. Place the trout in the sauce, baste it a bit and simmer for 10 minutes on each side. 
Meanwhile, prepare a garnish of two tablespoons of flat leaf parsley, the zest of a lemon, the chopped leaves of the fennel, and two chopped spring onions. Cool the trout, sprinkle on the garnish, and serve. Now I want to show you a recipe for what I think is my most favourite fish, and that's skate wings, which I think have the sweetest flesh perhaps of all fish. And this recipe is for skate wings cooked in warm green salsa, and you start off by taking two skate wings and coating them in seasoned flour. And I know that skate wings do have bones in them in the centre, but I just want to tell you, if you haven't eaten them before, that the bones are really quite soft and gelatinous. And when the fish is cooked, um, it, the flesh separates very easily from the bones and they really don't get in the way of eating. Now, have in a frying pan a couple of tablespoons of olive oil. Turn the heat up high and we're going to cook the skate wings for about four minutes on each side. And while they're cooking, we're going to make a sauce. So as soon as it's really hot, in they go. Number one and number two. They've got to go into hot fat and then as soon as you feel that they've, they've seized up on one side, just turn the heat down a little bit. And then while they're having their first four minutes, you can get on with making the sauce. This is adapted from an Italian sauce called Salsa Verde. And you start off with a, a pestle and mortar with a clove of garlic, a whole clove of garlic. And then you add half a teaspoon of rock salt. This is flaked rock salt, which has a much saltier, nicer flavour than ordinary salt. And this is the way to crush a clove of garlic, or the best way, is to just smash it up and then mix it with the salt and it quickly becomes a cream. When I first started cooking on television, I was showing people how to crush a clove of garlic with um, a small, the flat of a small knife and it flipped up like a tiddly wing and hit the cameraman in the eye. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that today. There we are. That's to a paste now. And the next ingredient I'm going to add is the juice of two limes. So that'll go in with the salt and the garlic. And next ingredient is grain mustard, a heaped teaspoon of grain mustard. Give that a little swirl in. And next, capers again. I do like capers with fish. And this sauce made with capers has this lovely sort of Mediterranean flavour. There we are, a tablespoonful of capers. And then in front of me here, I've got some anchovies. So the anchovies are going to go in now, but I'm just going to snip them up into small pieces. When you use anchovies, don't put any salt in anything because anchovies are quite salty and they provide the salt. So that's the anchovies. And now we're going to use some nice fruity extra virgin olive oil, two tablespoons. Give it another mix. And then it's going to have some fresh herbs. The wonderful, wonderful basil, first of all, about a tablespoonful of that. And a couple of tablespoons of this, which is flat leaf parsley. Now, it, it actually tastes the same as curly parsley. But it's nice, I've been growing it this year, just to have something different. And it's very good, actually, for um, decoration. It's nice for garnishes, flat leaf parsley. Once you start to chop basil, in fact, from the time you pick it, by the time you finish chopping it, you get this absolutely fantastically wonderful aroma. And that begins to make me feel hungry. One more chop. And then the herbs will go in to join the rest of the ingredients. Give it another good mix and 
put a little bit of freshly milled butter in before you do that. And now we take the sauce over to the fish and then turn the fish over and give it some more cooking on the other side. So over it goes onto the other side. Number one and then number two. And then that just needs to be cooked now for another four minutes. It's quite funny because as you watch them cooking, their wings sort of flap up and down a little bit. They look as if they're going to take off. So now we're going to add the sauce. Just give it a little mix and then pour it into the saucepan, frying pan, sorry, round the fish, over the top. And all that needs to happen, give the pan a shake, all that needs to happen now is for that sauce to just heat through and then heat out and it's ready to serve. Skate wings with warm green salsa. One of the great delicacies to be found here in East Anglia are the crabs that come from Cromer and all along the North Norfolk coast. Early in the morning, traditional small wooden boats like these are still unloading the day's catch on the beach. Thank you very much. These are very much small family businesses, handed down from father to son. Thankfully, so that we can all taste the delicacy of freshly caught crab. Now I have to make a confession and tell you that I'm not really a real cook because I couldn't possibly boil a live crab, and you're supposed to if you're a real cook. But anyway, if you can only get a crab that's already boiled in its shell, then I have given all the step-by-step -step instructions as to how to dress a crab in the cookery course. But if you get the ready-dressed crabs, you usually get about four ounces in each one. And so I'm using two of those, emptied out here on my plate to make eight ounces of crab, to show you a recipe for a crab salad vinaigrette. But I just want to talk about one ingredient, and that's this one here. These are continental cornichons. What's a cornichon, you're thinking? Well, it actually is a gherkin. But somehow or other, some of the gherkins you buy, the English ones, have very strong vinegar that takes the roof of your mouth off, and they're not really good for this recipe. So if you can get the continental ones, they're milder, and they're crunchier, and I think they have a much better flavour. Just hunt around for cornichons. Now, I've got all my ingredients for the vinaigrette here. First of all, the cornichons, two large ones chopped. If they're small, you'll probably need four, but that amount. Then next door, I've got a shallot that's been finely chopped, tablespoon of coriander that's also been finely chopped, the zest of a lime, and a tablespoon of capers. And then to make the vinaigrette, I'm going to start off with some wine vinegar, one tablespoon of white wine vinegar. That goes in first followed by the juice of a lime, which is about two tablespoons, and then a tablespoon of light olive oil. This vinaigrette is different from other vinaigrettes and it has actually more um, lime juice and vinegar than it does oil because the richness of crab meat. Um, now we're just going to put in a, a few drops of Tabasco sauce. I think that's about six drops. Um, some salt and some freshly milled pepper. Couldn't be easier, this recipe. And now the crab is going to join the vinaigrette mixture. Into the bowl it goes. And then we're going to go in and give it a good mixing. In fact, I'll switch to a fork. It's beginning to look lovely colour. It's the nice thing about crab meat is it always looks such a pretty colour. Shape the crab into little rounds and serve it with some mixed dressed salad leaves. Now I want to show you one of my favourite recipes for crab. This one's called Rosty Crab Cakes. And I don't know, I've got a thing about fish cakes. I think they're very good to serve because people who don't like to eat whole fish or they don't like bones and things like that, it's nice to eat fish as a fish cake. And these, I think, are five-star fish cakes. Now you start off with some dressed crab, eight ounces of dressed crab in a bowl. That's one sort of medium size. 
or two little ones, I find, yield eight ounces. And then, as I've said before, we need lots of sharp in there to counteract the ri richness. So we're going to have a tablespoon full of lime juice, first of all, and then a little bit of grated zest of lime, and about, about a teaspoonful of this altogether, which is probably about two or three scrapings with the zester. Wonderful aroma when you do this. I just think something about limes and summer that matches so well. Right, a little bit of lime zest and then some more sharp and I've got here two spring onions and these have been very, very finely chopped and include the green part. Helps with the colour. Then a little bit more green, a tablespoon of freshly chopped coriander leaves. If you can't get coriander at all in any of the recipes, you can always use fresh chopped parsley. And these are capers again. Tablespoonful. If they're very large, you can chop them, but I think the size of those is okay. Now, rosti is actually a Swiss potato dish, and it's made with grated potatoes. So I just want to show you how to do that. You start off with some potatoes that are nice and firm and waxy, and you put them into boiling water for just 10 minutes with the skins on and then when they've cooked for 10 minutes take them out, cool them and peel off the skin. These are called uh, salad potatoes in the supermarket and they need to be firm and waxy because we're going to grate them on, on the coarse side of the grater. Don't forget to put a timer on though because 10 minutes goes by very quickly and I'm always overcooking them so try not to do that. And then when you've peeled them Grate them on the coarse side of the grater, taking the potato all the way down so that you get nice long strips of potato. It's very important in this for the looks of it. And while I'm grating the potatoes, they're, they're not quite cooked. You can sort of hear they're a little bit raw inside because they're going to be cooked with the crab cakes. Um, just let me tell you that you can make rosti fish cakes with any kind of fish. They work extremely well with salmon. I've done your recipe for salmon, rusty fish cakes. They work very well with any white fish. And they also work with salt cod. Salt cod is dried cod, salted, which you soak overnight in several changes of water. I'd like to see more of it around. It's got a wonderful flavour and I think makes very, very good fish cakes. Um, so there we are. I haven't told you the amount of potatoes here, but it's five ounces. So there's a few little bits there that aren't grated. Now I'm going to just transfer the grated potato over to my bowl here. Pick up any escaped bits. And then I'm going to go in with a fork, very, very gently, and just mix and toss the mixture together. And you need to be gentle because You've taken a lot of trouble to get little strips of grated potato which match the little strips of crab and you don't want to break them up too much so just gently mix it all together and then it's going to have some seasoning and the seasoning is a couple of pinches of cayenne pepper give it a little bit of a zing some salt and I like to put a little bit of uh, ground pepper in as well I always like things fairly well seasoned. That's beginning to look a lovely pretty colour now. Now everything's thoroughly amalgamated. You divide it into about eight portions. I find sort of round, roughly a heaped tablespoonful. Into your hands like this and then begin to firm it up into a little cake. Now you need to go quite firm pressing it together because you've got to cook them and you don't want them to all fall to pieces. But while you're doing that, don't worry about these ragged edges because they actually look very, very nice. And when you're frying them, which we're going to do in a minute, you'll find the raggedy edges crisp up and they're very nice when you eat the fish cakes. Then you put them onto um, a plate, cover them with cling film and you leave them for about two hours in the refrigerator because they need to really firm up. Two hours minimum, but you can actually leave them all day if you want to. 
Then, to fry them, to cook them, you need some really hot fat. And that's another thing I, I have to tell you, is when you're making any kind of fish cakes or meat rissoles, anything like that, um, if you have trouble with them breaking up, it's usually because the fat isn't hot enough. So have the fat really, really hot. I can see a bit of smoke coming off there now, so I think we're OK. And here are the chilled crab cakes. And gently take them with a fish slice down into the hot fat. And they're going to take three minutes on the first side. Once they're in and they've seized up, you can turn the heat down a bit. And then three minutes on the other side. Right, now I want to show you some finished rosty fish cakes. And I've got them all lined up here. These are the salmon. And you don't need to cook the salmon first. You just chop up raw salmon and proceed as we did with the crab cakes. Next door, we've got the crab cakes, which are like the ones we've just made. And then here, these are rosty fish cakes made with cod. Now I want to talk a little bit about accompaniments. Now I have to say that the very best thing in the world to serve with, with crab cakes is this here. This is a jar of pickled limes. They're very, very simple to make. And once they've been in the pickle, they have this wonderful, sharp, beautiful flavour of limes that just counteracts the ri richness of crab so perfectly. And I think they're very good with, with other fish cakes too. These two sauces I've got in front of me now, well, they're not sauces. They're actually called salsas, which is a, a Spanish, Mexican term. And what they are is it's sort of halfway between a salad and a sauce, and it's just a mixture of chopped ingredients. This one is roasted sweet corn salsa, and you toast a head of sweet corn underneath the grill until it's nice and toasted. Take the kernels off and just mix them with finely chopped red onion, chopped coriander, lime juice, and a little bit of chopped red pepper you can see there, and a little bit of chopped tomato. And that is a wonderful um, sauce, salsa, to serve with any kind of fish cakes or any kind of fish, in fact. And then I've got another salsa over here. This one is made with avocado. And this is really like guacamole chopped up instead of being made into a puree. Finely chopped avocado, tomato, red onion again, coriander again, lime juice, and they've both got a little touch of Tabasco sauce in them, just to give them a little bit of heat. Right, well, that's two, three things to serve with fish cakes. If you want to actually cook some plain grilled fish in the summer, it's quite nice to have a nice summery sauce to go with them, so I'd like to show you that. This is a quick tartar sauce made with lime and coriander. First of all, break a large egg into the bowl of a food processor, season with salt and pepper, then add a small clove of garlic and half a teaspoon of mustard powder. Very slowly add six fluid ounces of light olive oil until the sauce is thickened. Then transfer it to a bowl and add four finely chopped small cornichons or gherkins, a tablespoon of chopped fresh coriander, the same of capers and a dessert spoon of lime juice. Mix well and one way to use this is to spread a tablespoon of it over any kind of fish fillet Sprinkle with a mixture of breadcrumbs, cheese and coriander and a little bit of lime zest. Place under a hot grill and grill for 10 to 15 minutes. And this is one of the best fast supper dishes I know. Well, that completes our programme on summer fish, but don't forget to come back next time because we'll be doing some holiday cooking at home. See you then.
first started cooking and writing recipes, I soon realised that continental holidays were going to be enormously important. Simply eating out in restaurants in various countries has given me a wealth of ideas over the years. What I've always equally enjoyed is delving around all the food shops and having a look at local wines in the areas where they're produced. I think we're so lucky to be part of a continent as diverse as Europe. No other continent has such a complete change of culture from one country to another, as well as a totally different cuisine. You could live off bread and cheese in Europe and never get bored because both the bread and the cheeses will be totally different as you cross the borders. With ingredients, there's always something new to be discovered and used for the first time. Saucissons, salamis, cured meats, different types of rice, and dried preserved wild mushrooms. I love the gnarled shape of real parmesan. I always think it looks so beautiful. And tomatoes dried in the Calabrian sun and steeped in the very best virgin olive oil. I have to confess that these luscious preserved tomatoes are making an appearance in quite a number of my recipes at the moment. Now, thanks to the age of communication, all these things have grown enormously in popularity in this country. So we're no longer forced to suffer the queues and delays at the airport to sample them. All we now need to do is select a recipe, make a shopping list, pop to the local Greek, Italian or whatever delicatessen and prepare some lovely holiday food without travelling very far at all. So nowadays you can eat Mediterranean right here at home anytime you want to and our first little holiday trip today is going to be to Greece, the islands and Cyprus. There you'll find lots of lemons and garlic. These are special Greek olives called Kalamata, watch out for those, they're quite special. These are cracked green olives from Cyprus and these are little peppers that are nice and piquant, um, bottled in jars in vinegar. There's lots of olive oil, capers and this wonderful cheese here which is feta cheese which you crumble over a lovely crunchy crisp salad. And what could be better to start the day with an authentic Greek breakfast, strained thick yoghurt with runny honey pouring all over it. And the first recipe I want to show you is a recipe for fried cheese and the cheese is halloumi cheese. This is actually a Cypriot cheese and it comes in little vacuum packs like this. You take it out and dry it and then before you fry it you cut it into slices like this. And then the slices have to go into some flour that's been seasoned with salt and pepper, two tablespoons of flour here, and give each little slice a good coating with the seasoned flour before it's cooked. And the recipe is called fried halloumi cheese with a lime and caper vinaigrette. And I've got heating in my frying pan here two tablespoons of, guess what, Greek olive oil. Extra virgin Greek olive oil for special flavour. And now these little slices are going to go into the hot oil. And this will serve two people for a light lunch, one cheese, or four people as a first course or a starter. I've got a few more slices here. And you fry them just for one minute on one side 
and you flip them over and fry them for another minute on the other side. Now while they're frying, on the first side, I'm going to make the sauce and I start off here with a teaspoonful, heap teaspoon of grain mustard. That's going into the bowl. Then I've got a chopped, rather fat clove of garlic there and that's being followed by the grated zest of a lime. Now in Cyprus they would use lemon and not lime but I think lime gives it a nice flavour but you could use lemon if you wanted to and also the juice of the lime. Then I'm going to use a tablespoon of fresh coriander leaves that have been chopped. If you can't get coriander leaves or you don't happen to like the flavour, then you can use fresh chopped parsley, that'll be fine. And now capers, a heaped tablespoon of capers. And then I'm going to use wine vinegar, one tablespoon of wine vinegar and two tablespoons of olive oil, Greek olive oil. You can see the sauce is beginning to look quite pretty now with all those colours blended together. It's going to need some salt, so I'll just sprinkle in a bit of rock salt there and some freshly milled pepper. Just give it a little mix and we'll just go over now and see how the cheese is doing. It's got to be nice and toasted and crusty. And as soon as that happens, you can turn it over and cook it on the other side. Have a look. Yes, that's perfect. It's, that's exactly how it's supposed to look. Turn all the pieces over, cook them for one minute on the other side, and then simply drain them on kitchen paper and pour the sauce over. And now we're in Italy with an Italian al fresco lunch. This is homemade focaccia, flat bread made with olive oil and rock salt and with a topping of red onion, sage and olives. Now this is something that requires no cooking. A selection of salamis, parma ham, served with olives, pickled artichoke hearts and the wonderful preserved tomatoes. I love Italian cheeses and one of the most famous mozzarella buffala is excellent marinated and served with slices of avocado just right for a cool lunch on a hot day. Well, one of the things the Italians really excel at is roasting peppers. I'm going to show you the most fabulous roasted pepper dish. This comes from the Piedmont area of Italy, and you need one pepper per person for a first course. It has to be a red pepper, only a red one, because the red ones have the right flavour for this dish. And you cut it in half, leaving the stalk intact. Don't take the stalk away because this helps to keep the pepper um, in shape while it's roasting. Take the seeds out and any sort of little pithy bits. Sometimes a few seeds lurk inside, so be careful. You do need to get them all out. Um, and then place them in a shallow roasting dish or um, a roasting tin, a, a very shallow roasting tin. It has to be shallow so that the roasting um, can proceed properly. If it's too deep, you don't get the edges nice and toasted. Right, so it's one pepper per person, and I've got the rest here ready cleaned, and they go into the roasting dish, like that, and then they're going to have another ingredient, and that is four medium tomatoes. Now the tomatoes have been skinned, and I'm just going to cut them in half like that, and then put two quarters into each pepper. Now the way to skin a tomato is to put it, put the tomatoes in a bowl, pour boiling water over them and leave them in for one minute exactly and then you'll find that the skins will slip off very very easily. Now this recipe has quite a colourful history. Um, it was brought from Piedmont by Elizabeth David, published in her marvellous book Italian Food and then an Italian chef cooking in Wales, of all places, the famous Walnut Tree Inn um, near Abergavenny. He served this on his menu there 
at the Walnut Tree Inn, and it was eaten by a London chef called Simon Hopkinson, who then served it on his menu at Bibendum, the famous Bibendum restaurant, where yours truly ate it, and fell totally in love with it. I can't believe that something actually so simple uh, can taste so wonderful. It's so easy, there's nothing difficult about it, and yet it really does taste wonderful. Now, the next ingredient is garlic, and just slice the garlic, whole garlic cloves, too, into little slices like this, and then put the little slices in the peppers. This is a lovely sort of robust peasant dish which needs quite a bit of garlic in it. Now the other thing I have to tell you about this recipe, garlic goes in next, just distributed between them, like that, and then anchovies, and I've got um, eight anchovies here, that's one per pepper half. And I'm just going to snip them up with the scissors and add those. But one of the things I want to tell you about this recipe is that what it proved to me when I first ate it, I thought, I've never tasted peppers so good as these. And the one thing that proved to me after I was given the recipe and I came home and made it was that you don't actually need to skin peppers. All that terrible performance putting them under the grill, getting them scorched and blackened, then putting them into a polythene bag and letting the steam um, soak them for a while before you get the skins off. It's such a performance and such a bother. And I don't think the peppers actually taste as good as when they've had the skins left on. You'll find in this recipe they'll be nice and charred and taste every bit as good, if not better. Now, I'm going to add some olive oil. This is a nice, fruity Italian olive oil, and we're going to have one dessert spoon in each pepper and you can see that this is a good olive oil you can see the beautiful color of it here and what happens is while the peppers are roasting the olive oil blends with the tomato juices and the garlic and anchovy and pepper juices and then you get a lovely sort of juicy sauce at the end which you need plenty of bread um, to mop up when you serve it right now just a little bit of freshly milled pepper. Um, no salt, because there's salt in the anchovies. And all that happens to this now is it goes into a preheated oven, a medium oven, gas mark four, or the equivalents, and they'll take about 50 minutes to an hour to become toasted round the edges and lovely and soft. Well, Italy really wouldn't be Italy without some pasta. And now I want to show you a recipe called spaghetti puttanesca. Now, puttanesca, translated in Italian, means lady of the night. That's why here in this house we call it tart spaghetti, presumably because the flavours are hot, strong and gutsy. Begin by heating one chopped fresh chilli and two cloves of garlic in olive oil and sprinkle in a dessert spoon of chopped basil leaves. Add six ounces of chopped black pitted olives. After that, add the contents of a small tin of anchovies snipped into small pieces, and then a tablespoon of drained capers. Now pour boiling water over a pound of ripe red tomatoes, and after one minute, drain them, slip off the skins, which will come away very easily, and then chop the tomatoes into small pieces. Then add the tomatoes to the saucepan, along with a tablespoon of tomato puree. Season with pepper, but not salt, stir well, and then leave it all to simmer for about 40 minutes, or until it has reduced down to a really thick sauce. While that's happening, boil eight ounces of spaghetti, or other pasta, in salted water for exactly eight minutes, no more, then drain and return it to the saucepan. Stir in the puttanesca sauce until the pasta is well coated and serve with lots of freshly grated parmesan. This will be enough for two. Now I want to show you a classic Italian recipe called salt in bocca. 
And that exotic name, translated in Italian, means jump in the mouth, but nobody knows why it was called jump in the mouth, so I'm hoping some Italian native might be able to write and tell me. Now, to make salt in bocca, you need to take fillet of pork, sometimes called tenderloin, and you need three pieces about half an inch thick per person. So you cut the piece off like that, and then the next thing you have to do is flatten it. And to do that, you use your fist, your clenched fist, fist and bash it about. Now, it's not the time to get rid of your aggression, so don't go too hard, because otherwise you'll break the meat. Just very sort of medium kind of pressure taps like this, and be patient, and eventually it will sort of spread out. Now, the reason we're doing this is because the original Italian recipe is made with veal escalops. But because veal is such an emotive subject in this country, I'm going to use pork, which actually has a better flavour than veal, I have to say. Now, when you've got, got it spread out like that, the next thing you do is you put on top of it a piece of parma ham. Now, this can be bought in packets like this in very thin slices from the supermarket, or you can actually get it from Italian delicatessens and they'll slice it and put it through uh, between little pieces of paper to keep it um, separate. Now, fold it over to make it roughly fit the piece of pork like that, press it down onto the pork, and then the next ingredient is actually a whole sage leaf. The sage leaf goes on top like that, and then you take a cocktail stick like this and break it in half, and you fix the sage leaf to the slice of parma ham and pork, and then that's ready to be cooked. And as I said before, you need three pieces per person, and then you can make this well in a if you want to, but I'm going to cook this now. And in my pan here, I've got um, some olive oil that's been heating, three quarters of a tablespoonful, and you need to have the pan really smoking hot like that. And then you just put the pieces of salt and bocca in, sage leaf underneath, so the sage leaf goes nice and crisp. And then you cook them for two minutes exactly on each side. And after two minutes, flip them over on the other side and give them another two minutes. Now I'm going to finish that off by making a little bit of sauce with another very Italian ingredient, and that's this one here, which is masala. This is an Italian fortified wine, and it's very rich and luscious, lovely in cooking. Here it is in the jug here, and I've got three fluid ounces measured out. Now, you can have either sweet masala or dry. I'm actually using the sweet today. And if you can't get hold of masala, don't worry, you can use a medium sherry. Now, what we're going to do is just deglaze the pan with that, just very, very briefly. Pour it in. And that, let that just bubble and reduce down to a, a syrupy consistency. You need it to reduce down to about um, two tablespoons. And then, as soon as that's happened, the bubbles will die down, it'll reduce to a syrupy consistency, and then it's ready to go straight to the plate and to eat. Now we're in Spain, and I've got in front of me here a whole selection of typical Spanish ingredients. And I'm going to make you a typical Spanish recipe. It's called chicken basque. And I started off making chicken basque by browning some chicken joints. This is a three and a half pound chicken. It's been jointed into eight. And you start the recipe by just browning it so that it's nice and sort of golden around the edges. So that's waiting now for the rest of the ingredients, and we'll deal with those. The first one is a very Spanish ingredient. This is chorizo sausage. And this is a sausage made with pork and with paprika. It's quite spicy. You can either get the mild version or you can get a version called chorizo picante. Either way, you need to peel off the skin, which I'm doing now. And once you've, you've made a slit across it, it should peel off quite easily. There we are. And then you cut the chorizo into little chunks. 
<laughs> this recipe has already been published, Chicken Basque, and it's become very, very popular with the people who've made it. One lady wrote to me and told me that she'd made 16 photocopies for her friends, so that's quite a good recommendation, isn't it? Now, I've got about five ounces of chorizo here, which is two sausages. Sometimes you buy it in a large one and chop it up, so five ounces you need. Now, that's going in to join some garlic here. I've got two cloves of garlic and they've just been peeled and, and roughly chopped into chunks. Now the next ingredient. This is a Mediterranean ingredient that you find all the way along the Mediterranean. It's sun-dried tomatoes and what happens is where they grow tomatoes successfully they have a glut sometimes at the end of the summer and they just dry them in the sunshine and then they put them, they either keep them dried or they put them into jars of olive oil which is what's happened to these and they're ready to use all through the winter you can have that taste of sunshine but I actually like using them in the summer too because they have this lovely concentrated tomato flavour and for those of you who grow your own tomatoes I've actually done a recipe though unfortunately we can't dry them in the sun here but we can dry them in the oven and they work quite well now we move back to the cooking pot this is the large pan which I fried the chicken in and I'm going to turn the heat right up it has been sort of on the 